ね。そう<笑>大丈夫。だけ。だけ。I'm briefly checking the technique because I receive a sign that we are able to start, though I see that the door is still open, so I briefly wanted to check. Is it really a go? Or should we wait a bit more? Yeah, all right, let's do that. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Elin Banken. I work as a dramaturg for the Belgian City Theatre in Brazil. And together with my colleague from IFEM, I have been coordinating uh, the series School of Resistance over the past few months. Uh, a project that began online, but has now once more landed in the physical sphere. And tonight at the British House here in Berlin. Welcome everybody here in the audience, but also online. Um, I am very pleased as well to see that they are all tuning in from all around the world. In the next hour and a half, I will be guiding you through the conversation that will look into the practices, several practices of art and justice. And therefore, the majority of the questions that I will address will situate somewhere between the border or the crossroads between art and activism. The questions are, how can civil society resist criminal policies? How can it use the means of art and law to create new alternative spaces of solidarity? And how can we, as hum human rights lawyers, as activists, as artists, together create a politics and an aesthetic of justice. As you will discover in the next hour, I have a very rich and a very diverse panel with me. So that's why this conversation will be divided, so to speak, into three parts. Uh, we start with a very, very concretely uh, with the situation of the refugees at the European borders and some legal responses towards it. In a second step, we will debate how global injustices can be addressed with both legal and aesthetic means. Whereas in the third part, I would like to ask my panelists about the emancipatory potential of art. So, to open this discussion, I would like to welcome my first two panelists that are sitting on the right side of me. Both were able to join me here on stage. Welcome, Omer Shah. Welcome, Mirkasa Kariki. Um, yeah. <laughs> but first, let me introduce them properly. Uh, Omer Schat is an attorney whose current focus is the questioning of the European migration policy by means of strategic legal cases. On behalf of two asylum seekers, he filed a lawsuit against the EU border agency Frontex. And then Mirkasa Farouki is a human rights activist from Afghanistan. Currently, he is living in Munich as a refugee where he is working with the Refugee Council, where he is responsible for managing legal issues of asylum seekers who are entering the country. Thank you, Kirsten, for, all for uh, being here tonight with me. Um, I would like to start this debate or this conversation really uh, with a question for you, Mirkasa. Um, because last week you gave a very strong speech in front of the Reichstag building together with the activist network whom you already saw leave no one behind. And in that speech, you testify that you're no longer interested in the big who question, who should be held responsible for the political situation in Afghanistan. What you are worried about though are the 20 phone calls you receive every day from your family members and acquaintances uh, that are still living in Afghanistan. Um, can I ask how, how are they holding up and, and how is it for you to receive these calls on, on a daily basis? First of all, thanks uh, for me and welcome to everybody. As I said to among of you guys, yeah, of course that I had a uh, speech uh, last week in front of the Bundestag. And uh, thanks for the organizer that they give me the opportunity that I talk over there and I raise my voice. Yeah, it's happened in four days. 
that it's happened that I just sleep at night and then wake, wake up in the morning and just as Kabul is just flat. It is a little bit weird and it is very fast for that. And the reason is of the question is that, that who, I, I should say that it is not about that only our um, mistakes, it is the mistakes and the consequence in the result of the 20 years war that we face with that, and after that, they just give up the whole country in a four days, in, a four, in four hours, and that's it. Of course, I'm receiving pretty much phone calls, first of all, from my families, and after that, from my friends, all of those friends that they are working over there with me, with the national and international organizations, that they have a very bad situation. They are witnessing different stories, different issues day by day. Last day that I was just receiving a message that they are coming during the night and they are taking the people without any issues, without any things, just for this reason that they are being implied by the international organizations, but still they are over there in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The question is that why? Because I cannot answer these things, but I'm just publicly asked that why they are still lead or left behind. One of my family member, because it is my personal personal stories that one of my family member, he or she worked for the German governments for the last of two or three years, and till now, he or she is still in Afghanistan. The question is that why? I just sent an email at 25th or 26th of August to a foreign minister of Germany. I sent an email, but still I didn't receive any response. For the specific office, I sent an email, but still I didn't have any answer for them. Still, I don't know that what's going to be happen on my family. What will be the next? What will be the future? The only one thing that I can that I can answer their call, even if I'm during the work, even if I'm sleeping, the thing is that I'm helpless. I, I have no assist, no cooperation from my family. The only thing that I can answer their call, then I will say, yeah, next day will be the good day, or future will be the good day. But still, I don't know that how long does it take. Regarding the my friends or colleagues. It is shameful for the German governments that they left all us, all of those people that they work over there, they help international organizations, our embassies, our countries, but they still there in Afghanistan. I'm not living in other European countries, but I'm living in the last of five years in Germany. But what I, but what I just realized is that the ministries in Germany, they are they are really shameful for Germans because it is the minister or the ministry's employment should not act like this. Regarding the, yeah, I can say because I'm sometimes I'm getting emotional. Mm -hmm. I don't know that because sometimes that sometimes a lot of things that's coming on my mind and I cannot say because it's very difficult. It is very difficult that my family they are in the bad situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, as you already said, you uh, came to Germany over over five years ago. You it's what said, 2016. Yeah. yeah. Um, in that same speech that I referred to, you also a refugee is like being an outsider, being a social pariah. Um, could you explain or illustrate what that means and how you have been uh, experiencing that yourself? What I think that for the politician. It's the first question that they are not integrated pretty much good. I'm the, what I know that I'm not um, saying about someone else, but I'm saying about myself that I'm just integrated pretty much good. I just learned the language pretty much sufficient. And then I just integrated. I find a friends over there. And it means that I'm integrated in the community. But in the meantime, when I'm just looking for apartment, it's like a, years that I find out about inside of Munich city. It is, it is what I know that it is a little bit weird or it is very difficult. It means that I'm a still an Auslander or a still I'm a foreigner. The second, the most 
important question for all of those people that they have a, with the immigration background, it is with the job market. Before with the panel, we just hear that they need for the sixth generation that they have, after the sixth generation, they have the same mm -hmm. income but still for the job market, they have a problems. I know that during last year, or one and a half year, I just, I was looking for a job, like I had just received like about 350, like upsage or negative answers for companies because of that, that I'm, maybe I have an, a background of that, that I'm as an immigrant. It is sometimes, it's difficult to, different things, the same way that I'm just giving the same rent, the same tax, like as a German. I know that I have a, like a, as a Anja Kenfluchling, but it doesn't mean that I have a, just the whole rights that the German government or the German people or the other European Union people, they have it, but I don't have a, this kind of opportunities to make my life easy and to be integrated pretty much more in widely. Yeah. Um, Murtaza already talked here about human rights not being respected. Uh, that brings me to my other guest, Omer. Um, you're an international human rights lawyer and uh, are of course well aware of the, uh, the human rights violations by the EU in the current migration policy. Of course, I know it's a big, uh, it's a big question also to answer tonight and, and maybe you also don't know the, the full scale scale of, of the answer, but what do you believe that, that needs to ensure human rights for all? I think they will... Ah, okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I think after hearing my friend here, um, I think the first step would be to understand or acknowledge what we are witnessing or what we are experiencing. And um, even though I'm more, um, my work is more focused on the external side, on the migration to Europe, less so on the conditions inside. Um, I think the common strand is that, you know, there is this um, dissonance between um, what the law is and what the discourse also is and on the other hand, what the practice is. Mm. So, and we are a bit confused. We, we try to find the right language to describe it. And, um, and the law is also a language um, and that gives us the, the ter terminology. And, um, and when we talk about human rights, uh, there are two parts to this uh, uh, notion. One is human and one is rights. And I think uh, until recently, most of the civil society organizations and um, were framing the situation as a deprivation of rights, mm -hmm. as a, the right to work, the right to asylum, the right to the right to live any country. By the way, this is a, this process that we are witnessing is not um, um, the right the right to leave Afghanistan, the right to seek asylum, not only to receive asylum, but not only to be granted a refugee status. Mm -hmm. um, but in any event, yeah, the focus was on the deprivation of rights and therefore the framework, I would try to remain not so legal, uh, uh, was on human rights law. And when we talk about human rights law or human rights, in general, um, lawyers uh, um, would, would, what it means, it means that uh, it it concerns what we, what we term as a state responsibility. Mm. So uh, rights are deprived, rights are infringed, and so on. So we go to courts. Uh, in Europe, typically, it would be the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And we, I don't know, uh, uh, um, someone against Germany, against Italy, against. Um, but I think um, my understanding was after being uh, 15 years that I'm lawyering um, is that this project of um, human rights law and state responsibility is failing. And why is it so? Uh, and first and foremost, there is no enforcement. So if we talk about international refugee law, um, this is what we call state-state mechanism. So only states can, uh, um, I don't know, sue other states mm -hmm. for infringing the refugee convention, for example. If we talk about 
human rights law, then of course you go to Strasbourg, as I said earlier, and, and, and to the European Courts of Human Rights, and you try to uh, challenge a certain country for a certain measure that is 99% you fail. But what I was, uh, um, my insight was that even if in the 1% cases that you win, um, actually the human rights law project, the project, the liberal ethos of the rights of men, everything that Europe was um, um, developing and adopting as, as, as um, after World War II um, is failing as well. Even when you, you win, um, actually the rulings of human rights law courts are um, inst states, instead of complying with these rulings, they, it actually pushes them, it incentivizes them to further externalize and further uh, outsource and uh, elsewhere and to others. And, and actually most of the migration policies today are, are, are executed uh, and implemented far away from Europe. Mm -hmm. So this kind of what I call the failed success of human rights, so even if, even if you prevail in court, the paradigmatic example is a ruling, the landmark ruling that everyone uh, or every student is uh, studying is the Hearsay judgment from uh, 2012, where the Strasbourg court said that uh, uh, um, states cannot uh, uh, refoule, cannot uh, send back people, even if they intercept them in international waters. Um, and wh what we see today is that the consequences of this ruling was that states said, okay, if we can't, if we rescue people in international waters, and that means that we have to disembark and bring them back to Europe, then we will stop rescuing them altogether and we let them drown, one, or alternatively, we will recruit others, militias, mercenaries, and so on, that will do the job for us and therefore we will not be held accountable. Mm -hmm. um, so my work, and this is, uh, um, the topic is the uh, tactics mm -hmm. of uh, uh, art and law. And uh, so wha what I see as uh, my legal art is that to try to cultivate new forms of responsibility uh, that are not what we call the lex latter, the, 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 mm -hmm. the existing law. And it doesn't mean that I invent it or I create it uh, out of nowhere, but it, it is prescribed in the laws and so on, but to litigate it and to structure the argument and fight to, to find the right case and so on, um, and means that I, I, we try in Frontlex, in the organization that mm -hmm. I am a member of, and, and um, to, to, to capture uh, and non-state forms of responsibility. So one example is the ruling uh, uh, that uh, I think you mentioned from 20, the ruling, the case from mm -hmm. 20, I wish there was a ruling, yeah. from 2019, where we captured individual responsibility, mm -hmm. the understanding that we must not go after the states, but after the state agents, the state officials, and um, also because the evidence that we gathered showed us that we are, not, no, we are no longer talking about simple human rights violation as refulmo, as a, the right to life and so on, but uh, the policies that are today uh, uh, in force are, are policies that uh, constitute uh, what we call international criminal, individual criminal responsibility for international or atrocity crimes that is crimes against humanity, mm -hmm. where the individuals are responsible for, for these policies, the officials, the politicians, the bureaucrats, the advisors, and it's a huge complex apparatus of power that is typical for the Commission of International Crime. So this is one case, mm -hmm. uh, the case that is now pending before the International Criminal, Criminal Court in The Hague, which uh, um, we are working with the Office of the Prosecutor mm -hmm. and we have a few dozens of suspects. Yeah. The other form of responsibility that was recently filed to the European Court of Justice, to the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg, um, captures for the first time as well, the understanding was that what we see is not particular to Italy, Libya, or Greece, Turkey, or Spain, Morocco, but we found a common, everywhere you look at, every jurisdiction that you go to, you see serious and systematic and widespread violations of fundamental rights and international uh, protection obligations. 
that is part of an EU policy, they understand that it's not about the member states, Germany, Italy, mm -hmm. they are not working in isolation, but in concert, and there is an overall agenda and campaign. And this is why, for the first time, we succeeded in, 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 in framing what we call organizational responsibility, that is the supranational entity that is the EU, and in this case, the border agency of the EU, Frontex, and we just in May, we filed a case on behalf of two, the case mm -hmm. you mentioned, uh, of two asylum seekers. And, and we are trying also there. Maybe one last word, I, mm -hmm. I see that my time is up. <laughs> uh, um, something about, again, because it's something, the, 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 in, the interface between uh, uh, law and art, there is something that we must, I must say about, the civ about us, about NGOs mm -hmm. and activists and the civil society. There is, a, a, as the moderator, why there is no, why, why now? Mm -hmm. Or why until now it was not, because it's not new. We are facing this in the past five, since 2015, 14 more or less. And I think there is in the civil society com community, in the, the NGOs and so on, um, reluctance um, to challenge a, a misconception of what the law is. And, and first and foremost, there is this concept of uh, like fear from a bad precedent. So we will go to court, we will challenge a certain policy, but all the jurisprudence, all the previous rulings and, and, and uh, uh, showed us that uh, uh, something different and therefore we will lose and then the court will say, will confirm the, the present policy, the, the crimes and the violation and so on. And this, I'm coming from Israel and Palestine, and, and, and I'm drawing on my experience in litigation there, and I faced the same, uh, the civil society there was the same. Every time I filed a case, I had like this, uh, many leftists on my shoulder saying, you should not, you should not, mm -hmm. it will only be worse and so on. And I don't know, there is this psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic, Winnic Donald Winnicott, a British one that I really like, and he, he some, at some point he said in some book, uh, in one of his books, he said, we are afraid only of from uh, things that already happened. Mm -hmm. And this is about the bad precedent. I mean, what, 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 I mean, now in Greece, in the Aegean Sea, uh, um, 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 the Hellenic Coast Guard throwing people into the water. There was a case of uh, uh, asylum seekers, not only refoulé, not only abandoned in the middle of the sea, but just they threw them into the water. In, in Libya, I'm sure everyone is, um, 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 is aware, uh, uh, there are uh, atro atros atrocious camps where the ICC prosecutor is saying that there are countless um, crimes against humanity, against migrants mm -hmm. committed as well. I mean, what are we afraid of? I'm talking about, again, the civil society. Every, the worst has already happened. We cannot be afraid mm -hmm. of something that already happened. And, and, and this is one thing. And the second thing is something about habitus, about the, 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 the um, difficulty sometimes to, I mean, to understand that the, polit the polity, the political community that we inhabit, that we live in, that the people that we take the drink outside the theater uh, uh, and they vote the same party that we vote and they go to the same school and et cetera, et cetera but they work in the European Commission. I mean, the, 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 the difficulty to, to understand that the EU as a non-authoritarian, as a liberal democracy, is responsible for these kinds of policies. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then to treat that accordingly, as I said, as a criminal uh, 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 policy and not just a simple human rights violation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, both of you, for sharing this insight into your uh, own personal legal practices. Um, this is also the point where I would like to introduce two more guests, um, namely Milo Rao and Selim Cisena, to help me address the question how we can use cultural institutions such as theater as a space to try out alternatives. Uh, Milo Rao has managed to join me here on stage, and Selim is joining us from her office in Lubumbashi, but let me also introduce them properly to you. Um, Selim Cisena is a human rights activist and lawyer, and she works as an investigator on the project series, the Congo Tribunal of the RPM, and that's since 2015 onward. Milo Rao is an author and director, and is also the uh, artistic director of the IRPM and the Entegent. And since 2002, he has published over 50 plays, books, films, and many more. 
Um, let me start off with you, Milo. Uh, as I said, in 2015, you created the Congo Tribunal, which is a theater tribunal about the war that has been going on in the African Great Lakes for over uh, 20 years. For those who haven't heard about the project yet, could you maybe briefly uh, summarize what it was about? Yeah, uh, perhaps we have to have a, a, a very fast look and I'm, I'm sure that Celine will give more details about the situation at that very moment um, on the situation and the reasons of this uh, civil war. And of course there are lo local reasons, local political reasons, but there are also economical reasons. Mm -hmm. Because it's the, the uh, region in the world that is the richest in, in raw materials. I mean, you, you all heard from Coltane, there is gold, and uh, uh, it's, it's mainly uh, um, enterprises from, for example, Switzerland, I'm Swiss, from Canada, who is uh, exploiting these uh, raw materials. So, and we were talking about appealing to courts, for example, mm -hmm. when there is a legal case. And the problem in, uh, in, in, in global economy is that when a Swiss enterprise goes to Eastern Congo and, for example, pushes people from their lands, uh, there is no court they can go because there's no court in, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in the Democratic Repu Republic of Congo that is functioning in a way that you could go there and there is no court, or there is, we were talking about the Lieferketten Gesetz, there is at that moment no court in Switzerland where you could go to. So the problem is that we have a global uh, economical system, but we have not a global legal system. And uh, we work together with a mixed team of uh, prosecutors and lawyers, for example, Celine, um, but also lawyers, for example, from the International Tribunal of Den Haag, and when I was asking them, what, why are you taking part in this theatrical tribunal, they said, because we can't bring this case to Den Haag, so we have to create mm -hmm. what we call a symbolical institution. And I think that's exactly to, to answer your question, what art can you can create a space, uh, a topical space, where you can bring reality and judge over reality. Of course, you have also to create somehow the law. So the law we used um, is a mix of, of, of different laws, the constitution uh, of the Congo, then um, economical law, human rights, and, and all these mixed. And the project consisted in the first tribunal that happened in 2015. We had sessions or auditions in, uh, in, um, um, in, in Eastern Congo and in uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we made a choice of, tr so one coltane mine from Switzerland, one gold mine from Canada, and one massacre that is linked to raw materials. And we tried uh, to make it as real, you could say, as, uh, as possible by having real prosecutors, uh, what they call chambre mixte, so mixed of international lawyers from The Hague and, um, and, and lawyers from, from the Democratic Republic of Congo to bring these two laws together and then inviting witnesses and um, delivering judgments in the end. Of course, there is no uh, legal follow-up of these uh, mm -hmm. judgments, but then what happened and is still happening now, and that's the idea, now we are in 2021, we will have the next auditions exactly in, in Kolwesi, close to Lubumbashi in, um, in December, mm -hmm. um, led by, by Celine, yeah. and um, that these institutions become real, yeah. are then um, accepted, so to say, by the Congolese mm -hmm. government and become part of the legal system mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that is really existing. Yeah. Yeah, that makes me wonder, and for that question I am turning to you, Celine. Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, see that you managed to join us on the screen. I'm looking at you in the screen, I don't know, uh, you probably won't see that I'm looking at you and I'm addressing you. Um, but as Milo said, you have been working mm -hmm. on the Congo Tribunal uh, since 2015 onwards. Um, and what I am curious about is um, what the possibilities of artistic interventions like these, uh, what, they, um, what they can bring to your own judicial work and also what the specific outcome of projects such as these have for uh, the Congolese citizens. Merci beaucoup et bonjour à tout Thank le monde. you very much. Hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me and giving me the word here 
to paraphrase what Milo just said, we could maybe begin by saying that the legal system in the um, Democratic Republic of the Congo, even before we began with the Congo Tribunal in 2015, since it hasn't really changed. There are several explanations for this. Unfortunately, we have a, a large spectrum of instruments, but the implementations is very difficult. So the legal system is often dominated by political powers and influences. So there is a serious problem because all decisions that can be taken in favor of the communities or of um, individuals that have juridical problems, um, they can't be implemented in ways that have positive consequences for them. And of course, these kinds of interventions in, um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I'm in favor of these because they encourage a legal system that encourages a um, distributive justice, a community justice that permits people to meet. There are local communities that have began meeting due to this project. As Milo has said, we are not only dealing with situations of war at the east, but at the level of Kowesi. There are concrete problems with those corporations that exploit the mines. As Milo said, Congo has a lot of resources, but they hardly benefit to the community that lives there. So, for example, when corporations do not manage human rights, when I speak of human rights, I mean, for instance, also the environmental situation, the sanitary situation, I mean the um, situation of work, um, of using the working power of the people who live outside, uh, who live nearby. Um, we treat um, matters of work law, of, um, of contracts um, that are terminated within our reason. Um, and when this occurs, the people who are victims of these infractions, they don't know, um, as Milo said, uh, which court to address, which Congolese court to address. And there is this um, idea of influence that doesn't allow these people to present themselves in front of a court. And there is a big problem of corruption that is also beating a new record within the legal system. So when you want to move forward against a corporation that infracts human rights, this corporation can easily influence judges or lawyers who are treating this case because they have much, many much bigger means. So the notion of respecting human rights is blurred in that way because the legal system doesn't manage to make these corporations respect them. And there is another system, because, another problem, because we would need to reinforce our own legal system even within Congo at the national level. If we look at the number of violations of human rights law violations in Congo, so if we go beyond the area of the exploitation of mines, as Milo said, we will be talking uh, in December to all people involved, politics, people who work for the corporations, the community itself, the civil society, and everyone will have to and get to express their opinion to find out what are the actual problems and what possible solutions we can find for the communities that are the victim of this. Mm -hmm. And to come back to the results or consequences of this particular project that you asked about for the population of Congo, I think that we should play a bigger role in the global community to um, treat these real problems of human rights infractions. We are right now in storing um, tribunals, popular tribunals, 
of course, this is a fictive tribunal. These are not um, tangible cases, actual cases, but this tribunal will spark in the head of several parties, whether it's the institutions, the community itself, or individuals, or other communities that are equally affected by this exploitation of the mines. This could, I think, spark the idea that there are rights that should be respected. Even when we say that the um, Democratic Republic of Congo should respect certain rights and has obligations in the face of its own population, the corporations also have obligations, legal obligations, vice versa, the um, communities that are impacted by the exploitation. And they are all negatively impacted by those um, exploitations because the work, the local workforce is not used. Um, there is no electricity, there is no environmental uh, respect, there is no water, everything that they would need to survive every day is not respected. So artistic um, possibilities, as my colleague has said previously, um, our, our language as lawyers is our art. So when we address a corporation that doesn't respect the human rights, we can um, use this art by confronting it with a spectrum of legal instruments to make them respect, for instance, the code of mine exploitation in the Congo. So legally speaking, we can use these instruments um, in, uh, in a rhetorical way, in an artistic way, or all the ways that we can use them as jurists. And and even um, regarding human rights, all kinds of interventions, theater, music, sketches, are all possibilities that help us get the message across. Um, when Milo and the team came to Lumumbashi, we, we have seen that um, there was music, there was art, and um, that helped us get across the message that human rights are actually being violated here. And this is a good possibility to get this message across. Yeah. And just as the Congo Tribunal did, there are several possibilities regarding the protection of human rights. And I also think that one of the most important elements, and I think we will work on this in December, is to claim social justice for everyone uh, from an artistic point of view. So claiming social justice for everyone from the point of view of the artist, these artists can be musicians, can be theater artists, comedians, and then at all levels, the message will come across and this will later be considered and have an impact. So to answer uh, your question, um, my answer I hope was complimentary to uh, that of Milo, and um, if we need sure. further clarifications to the different problems that we have encountered, especially in Kowesi, with the corporations that exploit the mines. As you know, those corporations that are here, we have no possibility at all to engage a procedure against them legally. We need to go in front of the um, European court but who here, who has no means, who has no impact, no influence, can go um, before these courts and engage a procedure? So it is all the more important that we can create local mechanisms here of social justice to claim this right in a different way. It's true for many of these communities that many are ignorant of their true rights, but the Congo Tribunal, for instance, has awoken their awareness of these rights. For instance, non-governmental organizations are now working 
on these questions of natural resources and watch how communities are impacted by the activity of corporations that exploit the mine. And so we can include all parties that are involved in this process to enforce that the rights of these communities are being respected. And when we reinforce the power of these communities themselves, it helps them to at least have an awareness of what are their rights. Many are not aware, many are at first satisfied to welcome these corporations that um, take their space, that pollute their environment, the, envi the water that they use to wash themselves, to cook, to drink, who also pollute the air. Because as you know, um, mine exploitation deteriorates extremely the air quality and this entails terrible health issues for many people. So I tell you there are many things who can't, causalities who can't even be explained. Many people don't know how to claim their rights and they don't know that their human right is being violated. So when activists, human rights activists and artists help us raise this awareness, this can somehow compensate the lack of possibilities that we have at a legal level mm -hmm. within the Republic um, of Congo or vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. So when we want to have an impact at the national level, as our legal system is entirely overpowered by our political system, Unfortunately, the political po politics have the hand on the legal system and these communities are sandwiched uh, within a system of um, different influences and even if they know that their rights have been violated, they don't know how to claim them and many stay passive and accept their suffering. And our Congolese authorities, some, some hear the voice of these communities but others really give the impression to not know at all about the problems mm. that these communities encounter. Yeah. Celine, I'm so sorry, but I think I will have to uh, interrupt you because of course is time is running quickly. And um, yeah, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Milo, um, for this insight that you gave into the Congo Tribunal, the, the, the after effect it sparked. And I also want to wish you uh, all the luck with the hearings in, uh, in December. Um, at this point, I would like to go to yet another topic which um, I wanted to address tonight, and that's a topic Merci beaucoup. Merci the beaucoup. Thank you, thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> another All topic right. that I want to address, and that is the uh, emancipatory potential of art. Uh, the question, can art uh, be a tool of survival and hope. Uh, and we've invited two artists uh, from with me um, to give us an insight into their personal why. And that is Parvana Amiri and S. But again, also for these two uh, interesting guests, let me introduce them properly. Um, Parvana Amiri is an author and human rights activist. As a refugee from Afghanistan, she uses her writing from Lesbos to advocate for dignified living conditions for migrants. And S is an Afghani community theater facilitator. And since 2008, he has led hundreds of workshops and performances throughout Afghanistan, including the most dangerous neighborhoods and um, communities. Um, all right, as you might have heard in my introduction, I am talking about a person S. Uh, you will also not be able to see him or his moving image on the screen. That's because of safety measures, because S is currently in exile. Uh, but even though despite all these hurdles and this specific difficult situation, he was willing to join us in this conversation tonight. Uh, so S, very nice to hear that you managed to join us. I don't know if you could hear us. Thank you. All right. How are you doing? Sorry, I'm waiting for your question. I'm, I'm sorry? I didn't. I didn't get the question. 
Ah, I wanted to know how you're doing, basically, because we met yesterday uh, where we spoke on your situation, which is, of course, dire. And, and I just wanted to hear how you were doing tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's still, uh, we are waiting for mm -hmm. uh, what will uh, happen to our situation. So it's still, uh, uh, it is not a very clear uh, our future situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you have been, as I said in uh, in my introduction, you have been working. I don't know if that's with. Yeah, it seems to be over. Um, you have been working as a community theater facilitator, for which you've been following the tradition of the Brazilian theater practitioner Augusto Boal. Um, his theater of the oppressed is a dialogue form of theater that wants to promote social and political change. Um, could you maybe tell us a bit uh, about your own work that you have been doing in Afghanistan following uh, the legacy of Boal? Uh, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Es, uh, a human rights defender, uh, theater of the office practitioner, playback uh, theater facilitator since 2008. Uh, I am a member of an ethnic minority and religious uh, group and the father of uh, four children. So the reason uh, you may uh, see that uh, you are facing into a black screen, I really wanted to invite you and get your attention uh, to the Afghanistan unclear and dark uh, people's uh, life situation. And secondly, as you mentioned, uh, my colleagues, my family, my friends are still at risk. And that's why I do not want to uh, put their life in trouble by appearing in the public. I'm briefly looking at the technique as well to see, because if I'm not mistaken, this was indeed a recording of yesterday. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, all right. That's very... Uh, reassuring to hear. Um, so as I said, as um, you have been working as a theater practitioner, you have been giving workshops, you have been making performances over the last years following the legacy of Augusto Boal, who is uh, the theater of the oppressed, tries to seek a more dialogue form of theater that wants to uh, spark social and political change. Um, I was wondering if you could give us an insight in some of the performances you did or some of the work that you did in the last couple of years in Afghanistan? Sorry. As uh, you may know, uh, my organization is uh, a theater-based organization uh, that uh, our main uh, object, our main uh, uh, activity was in three areas. One was uh, human rights. Uh, uh, the other one was uh, uh, gender equality or women equal women rights. And uh, the third area was about transitional justice. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, as uh, a theater of the office, the facilitator uh, uh, has been led about hundreds of uh, workshops and uh, forum theater. Forum theater means uh, uh, public performance. Uh, in 25 provinces out of uh, 34 provinces of uh, Afghanistan. So really this methodology is one of the, most, the best methodology which can create uh, a safe space for the marginalized people, for those people who are not able to read and write the text, 
And uh, really, this methodology can uh, motivate uh, the people uh, to struggle for a better uh, life situation in the future. Yes, thank you very much. Um, another guest who has joined us in the Zoom room and who had to wait a while before she could finally speak, apologies, apologize for that, is of course Farwana Amiri. Uh, welcome, also very nice to see that you uh, managed to join us from uh, Greece, I believe, if I'm... Uh, um, what I want to start with is very recently you published your first poetry collection, uh, which is called My Pen Won't Break But Borders Will. Um, I was wondering if you could give us some insight into your own artistic history, uh, when and maybe why as well uh, was it that you started writing poetry? Hello to all participants and audiences of uh, tonight's event and webinar. I feel very honored to be among uh, such inspiring people that they are uh, acting in many different ways in order to make change in this uh, uh, not uh, so smooth path that we are all, uh, you know, that I am really new in this way. Uh, I am Parwana Amiri from Afghanistan. Thank you very much for your introduction and your invitation. Um, I live uh, with my family in uh, Greece, in Ritsona refugee camp. We arrived in 2019 in Lesbos, the most and the worst, uh, uh, in the worst uh, um, uh, um, refugee camp in Europe. And uh, however, I experienced the, the worst days of my life in uh, Moria, but I could learn many things being in that condition. And uh, I am, I am, I, I'm really happy that I experienced all those. Uh, um, hardships in order to uh, understand uh, the system, the way that the system is acting on us. When I was in Moria and I, and I noticed that there is less voices coming out of the camps, there are people that they are silent. And uh, tonight, uh, um, I am really happy also to, uh, not to meet, but also to hear about uh, Mr. S. Um, Mr. S is some, uh, some of the, uh, one of those that they are, uh, that he is not, uh, he was not able tonight to, um, you know, express uh, himself uh, by being in the screen. But, you know, on that time, many of the refugees, uh, even that we were in the margin of Europe, we were not able to uh, speak. We were not able to express about our problems. We were not even able to raise our voice. It was something that we were feeling being threatened and we were feeling being, uh, because we were afraid. All refugees are afraid of uh, speaking. And if you are uh, getting less voices coming out of the camps, if you are getting less voices from refugees, it doesn't matter that they are, that the condition is satisfactory for them. But we as refugees are really afraid of uh, expressing and revealing the realities of our life. And in the beginning, it was the same for me. So I started writing about condition because writing was a safe way in order to not be threatened and not to risk the asylum apply of my family in, in danger. Uh, it is a reality because on that time, even I was doing it with writing, many people were not even able to express the, uh, themselves, uh, you know, using literature. I used literature because on that time it was a safe way, but I was publishing my work uh, anonymously. And when we got uh, transferred after being assessed as a vulnerable family, in Ritsona, when I noticed the condition, and especially during the pandemic, the, mm, you know, the unfair system and the way that refugees are getting threatened in an unequal way, it was really suffocating for me and I was not able to, um, and I decided to step for, uh, further and to uh, and more resistant and not not only by writing by art by using literature but also by activism and acting and you know being really direct by the and uh, you know really being in the screen and without uh, um and uh, reducing uh, all those uh, fears and all the um all the things that I was uh, in challenge, uh, even being in a refugee camp, being a girl among uh, different uh, communities that uh, almost all of them, they had the same perspective and the same background of uh, having, thinking about the activism of a girl. Um, when I started writing in Moria by writing the first collection of my letters from Moria to the world, it really uh, made, it really, you know, gave me the idea that people really don't know about the condition. The people outside, they really need to have more information about the real life of refugees, the way that they are living. Media is, was talking about refugees, but it was not enough. And still, we don't have enough space in the media. 
to uh, to have our voice to really um, you know uh, to tell about the condition and all the challenges that we are facing in the in the refugee camps. Uh, one of the important points, many of people may think that I connected my art to my activist, but no, I connected my activism to my art because activism in my, uh, in my blood. I really, I wanted even to do uh, to do the same things in my back in my country, but in Afghanistan it was banned for the girls to. Uh, it was not really easy in the society that I was living to act and to um, and also even to write uh, in an activist way and to reveal the, um, uh, the realities of the society. And now that I am doing that without being really afraid uh, is that I want to challenge the democracy that uh, in the margin of Europe people are talking about it. Is it really existed or no? Mm -hmm. uh, I am talking and I am writing about uh, um, conditions in different ways, using literature in a poetic way, in a, in a, uh, through the text, uh, because I want to challenge the basic structures of the community and the society, the, the basic structures of the society that we are living in, and to uh, show that how um, you know uh, equal uh, is our life. Uh, I want to do it because I believe that communication and uh, being in connected with the uh, local community is a strong weapon and a strong way mm -hmm. of making change. And by breaking these borders of being far from each other by not having communications, I believe that we can do something. Um, if you may have any questions. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you get that, um, but the audience here in, in, in Germany was applauding, so they are very much into what you now just said. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe I briefly want to give them also uh, an idea of what it is that you write about, because I was so touched when I read it yesterday when preparing the conversation. So I quote a piece. Um, we travel through stony deserts on motorcycles, crowded pickups and trucks. We pass endless expanses, tackle mountains and rivers. We scale fences and cross oceans. We encounter policemen, soldiers, human smugglers and thieves. We are children, young people. We travel with our families, with our grandmothers and grandfathers or sick relatives. We are just people with a thousand different stories. As can be derived from this beautiful fragment I just read, um, you use your poetry to voice about thousands of people you see around you. You already mentioned the blog you started in 2019 when you entered Moria. Um, when we hear your poetry, we hear a very strong yet also a hopeful voice. Um, so that makes me wonder, in your opinion, can art be a tool of survival and also of hope? For me, art was not a, a tool for surviving and a tool for hope. It was a weapon for me to repress, uh, to you know, reduce all the uh, pressures that I was suffering at that time. It was the only way in order to, you know, really uh, to only reflect the uh, situation. In my writing, you will not find any expressing your or you know, uh, ju judgment about the conditions or even judgment about the uh, stories of people. I am just reflecting the. Uh, stories of people I am reflecting the conditions that we are living in without changing and without making any change the way that I'm doing it is that I don't want to represent the community that I'm living in I don't want to represent the rule uh, the um, stories of people and I don't want to represent anyone who is uh, trusting me who is putting their trust in order for me to write their stories but I am giving the voice to them something that we are really needing in the, in the time that we are uh, living in we need to have our voice. When we are able to talk, when we are able to express our, our uh, problems, why we should be always represented by others. And so it is not really true the way that we, are, we have been represented. And it is not only about literature that can be used as a uh, weapon, as a tool in order to, uh, in the activists. It can be done in many ways. Tonight we have the lawyers. Uh, we had lawyers and I had the, um, uh, I had the honor to uh, you know, have uh, their speech and to listen to them also the activists and artists. These are all um, 
main tools that we can use in order to make change. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the um, um, important and very highlightable points that was mentioned by one of the one of, by our um, liars was uh, the, that uh, many are mis uh, are making mi misconceptions of the what is law. I think you know uh, it is the same. I have been talking about law and legislations that are put on uh, refuges without making a um, real understanding of what uh, you know uh, why uprooted people, not refugees or so to call migrants, but uprooted people came from their country. Uh, there are laws and legislations that are put on us by the um, legislators, by the politicians. But uh, I think mm, it is a very great uh, power on the hand of lawyers that they can not only uh, you know make uh, and give awareness on uh, to people and to refugees and to give them uh, legal information but i hope there will be steps on making change on the laws and the current legislations i have been in contact and i had conversation with the politicians when i am talking with the politicians the politicians are telling me that the community is not ready in order to accept this uh, you know new wave of refugees or more people to come and uh, but when i'm talking with the community and that they are really they really want to give this voice to refugees in order to uh, talk and uh, to you know be in, in the society and to live but when i'm talking with the community the community are telling that they are putting their pressure on the politicians but the politicians are not uh, um, uh, they are not uh, ready to accept and they are making obstacles in order to not accept uh, uh, and to change the um, laws so um yeah but uh, so it has been always confusing to understand the reasons that all these uh, you know this uh, uh, miss, uh, you know, this border, this bridge is working, has been working like this. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Parvana. Thank you very much, S, for giving us an insight into your artistic practices. Um, before I end this conversation, I would like to give the word to one more guest which who couldn't be here tonight, either live on stage or nor on screen. And that's Murat El Kadani, who is the representative of the Belgian Sans Papier. It's a group of thousands of refugees that have been Belgian for several years, that have been sustaining the Belgian society, but are not allowed to partake in it. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, hundreds of them decided to go on a hunger strike, which lasted for over two months because they saw no way out. Uh, and despite the enormous stakes, the outcome has been minimal as Belgian p politicians haven't given any sign so far uh, to respond to the situation. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I am from a Belgian city theater, um, so the case lies close to our heart. Uh, we all know that this is a fight for humanity, solidarity and democracy. Um, and to say it in Dutch, ook deze sans papiers, uh, they are Belgian too. Um, but let us listen to Murat, to Murat, who prepared an audio uh, file for us, which we will hear normally right now. The situation of the sans papiers in Belgium now is Sans papiers in Belgium, as in many other parts of the world, are humans deprived of their humanity. You are exploited at every turn, you can work but you do not enjoy the rights of workers, without papers you don't even have the legal rights of the money you've worked for. You are forced to live a life on the outside, outside the law and outside society itself. You have no recourse to the law when you are cheated or abused. You have no say in how you are governed, no rights to education, to health care, to the rights other workers enjoy. You must live without a bank account or a registered address. You must live without a future. You cannot plan to buy a car, a house, or even to see your family. Your physical and mental health suffers, as do uh, your relationships. The hunger strike was a fight, first of all, about dignity. Belgium had accepted our labor for many years, but had failed to acknowledge our humanity. The saint papiers and the hunger strike were an essential part of Belgium's economic and social development over the last 20 years. The strike was a demand that Belgium acknowledge our contribution. It was a demand to be seen and treated as humans in the society we helped build. Some papiers in Belgium and elsewhere need to be acknowledged by the societies they live in. For some papiers to speak out for their rights is an enormous risk. Only with solidarity from the wider community, only when our friends and neighbors with papers stop looking through us and start seeing us, will the exploitation and abuse of migrant workers end. Some papiers are silenced by fear of losing work, accommodation, or liberty. They are silenced by the fear of being deported. 
The silence of people with papers over the suffering of those without papers is complicity in the oppression and exploitation of sans papiers. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank also the audience for uh, being with us for this conversation. Um, for those who are live with me, don't uh, go home yet. Um, but join us for a solidarity kitchen and a concert in the foyer that will happen within half an hour. Uh, also, please don't forget about the fundraising campaign, a uh, wave of legal action that was introduced uh, in the beginning of the evening. Information about that can be found on the website of either RLPM or of the website of Leave, Leave No One Behind. Uh, and remember that uh, by donating, uh, you'll help the work of lawyers such as Omer Schatz, for instance. Um, the only thing that I still have to do right now is to thank all my panelists, those that are sitting here with me, also the people online, Omer Schatz, Murtza Safarouki, Milo Rao, Selim Cisena, Parvana Amiri, and S. Thank you for these honest and uh, inspiring thoughts. Um, what I want to remember of tonight's conversation is that uh, we, as artists, lawyers, and activists, are not powerless. Uh, but that if we are courageous enough to question the current mode of being, uh, that we could spark some utopian alternatives. Our reality is not fixed, so let's change it. Thank you very much. Thank you.